where the author of Hebrews brings us today is to the very throne room itself. He brings us to the, the, the very feet of the Lord himself, and he asks us the question, are you faithfully fearing the Lord? Are you faithfully fearing the Lord? And he asks us as two evidences of this to check our hearts to see, are we in fact faithfully fearing the Lord? And here are the evidences. First, do we obey the word of the Lord? Do we obey the word of the Lord? And secondly, are we grateful to the Lord? We're about to take up and read, but before we do, let's ask for the Lord's help in prayer. Almighty God, we gather here now as a broken and lost people needing to hear what it is our God says. Lord, we come to your word confident that you have spoken and that it is sufficient for doctrine, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that we might be equipped for every good work. For your word, every bit of it, is spoken out and inspired. Lord, may we recognize this and may we cherish your word for by it, O oh Lord, we know who you are and what you require of us. May we now be faithful servants who come to you with reverence and awe as a daily act and a daily sacrifice of our lives, living to your glory, for that is our greatest endeavor in this life. Be with us now. Give us eyes to see ears to hear, and hearts to know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That is the inerrant and fallible and inspired word of our God, may he add his blessing to the reading of it. So as I was stating before, here the author has brought us to the final warning in the book of Hebrews. He's calling us now to check our hearts by these warnings. He's asking us to search our hearts deeply and ask ourselves these questions to see that we are truly following the Lord. And here, in fact, he comes to the very pinnacle of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a worshiper of God. He asks us the question, are you faithfully fearing the Lord? And in this first section, he shows us that the question that we have to answer in our own hearts to see if we are faithfully fearing the Lord, we have to ask ourselves, do we obey God. We see this in verses 25 through 27. Now, it, it has to be understood that what's being talked about here, he's just previously, as we talked about before, 
compared and contrasted those who God had spoken to in the wilderness in Exodus. The Lord had spoken audibly to the people at Sinai. And it's amazing to me how the people who were there at Sinai, who had, who had seen the plagues, who had seen the Lord split the waters, whom, whom had seen the marvelous hand of God speak through, through Moses and then speak audibly to them. How here, the Lord speaks to them and gives them the Ten Commandments. And the first of those commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. And after receiving that, it's in a breath, a turning of the page. And what are they doing? Having other gods before them. And the author of Hebrews here tells us that this the revelation that they received is actually not nearly as great as the revelation that we have from God. See the progression. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Who is that? That's the Lord himself. For if they, that is the Israelites who were at Sinai, did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him Who warns from heaven? Do you see the contrast? The author here is showing us the escalation, how how it is that, that we have received an even greater revelation from God than they did at Sinai. How is that? The author of Hebrews tells us in verses 1 and 2 of the book, in times before many ways and in many forms, the Lord spoke to us by the prophets, but now the Lord has spoken to us by his Son. The very pinnacle of the revelation of God is the fact that the word of God took on flesh and dwelt with us. The fullness of God's deity dwelt in Christ bodily, And in that, we see the demonstration of God's righteousness and his holiness and his wrath, but also his mercy and his love. That's why we have such an incredible witness to us. We have something even greater than than God speaking to Moses and then Moses speaking to the Israelites. We have the word of God Speaking to us now, Christ himself bearing witness to our very souls through the work of the Holy Spirit to then take up and read God's word and see, thus saith the Lord. It bottles my mind sometimes, especially searching my own heart, how often I have thought, I wish God would just tell me what to do. This is always great. My students always appreciate this story. I'll never forget one time it was during undergrad. Um, I was getting near the end of college. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. Um, I knew I had almost an ag degree. What do you do with an ag degree? I don't know. Feed people, I guess. Um, So there I was, almost done with my ag degree, and I did my usual... Uh, Christmas break thing where I go to East Tennessee, go on a long hike uh, in the Smoky Mountains, and uh, just spend the day there, just to decompress, to clear my mind of all that has happened before. And on this particular hike, I I was hiking up the mountain called Rocky Top. The song is based, it's a real place. Um, Yeah, it's a great hike. It's a very long one, but it's a good hike. So it was this Christmas, it was snowy. And I'm, I'm walking on, uh, on this hike, getting almost to the, the summit of Rocky Top. And I get up there, and it's this beautiful panorama, one of the few places in the Smokies that actually has, you can, you can just see all around you. There aren't a lot of trees on Rocky Top because it's rocky. So you're there, and I'm looking around, and I'm beholding God's glorious creation. And all the while, I've walked for probably three hours at this point. It's about 10 miles or so round trip, and, 
And there I am sitting at the top of this mountain. And the first thing I think is, God, I wish you would just tell me. What do you want me to do? What, what do you, where do you want me to go? Do you, do you want me uh, to go, you know, work here or here? What, what, what am I supposed to do with an ag degree? I don't know. I can't make anything grow. And the whole time I'm sitting there wrestling with this and thinking, what does God want me to do? And all the while, while this is going on, my Bible and my prayer life are stagnant. I'd ask God, what do you want me to do? With, at the same time, neglecting to see what God has said. And that is so often what we do. We long for God to tell us, do this or do this. But God has given us his complete and sufficient word. You can really tell people's actual doctrine of scripture by what they practice. There are lots and lots of people who say, yes, I believe that, that the Bible is the word of God. Very good. Do you cherish it? Do you study it? If the Lord told you through his word that this was right and this was wrong, would you believe him? And I would have to say, when I look at the world around us, we would say no. And that's a frightful thing. Because look at, look at what he's saying, the author here in Hebrews. Those who, who heard the word of God, who had heard God speak through Moses and said, yeah, that whole thing about you telling us not to have other gods before us, I don't like that. I don't like that. I want other gods before me. I like my gods. Um, they're a little bit more accessible, if you will. They, they're more entertaining. Much more fun golden calves and whatnot. But the author here says that we who stand this side of the cross have a much greater revelation. Don't find yourself hearing the revelation of God through the preached word and say, I don't care. It is a dreadful and fearful thing, as we've seen before, to fall into the hands of an angry God. That is scripture. We have to deal with that. But it's an even more frightful thing when I take into consideration just how many very, very lost people sit in the same pew they've sat in for 30 years, hearing the word of God preached and leaving way unchanged. What will you ever tell God? I went to church on Sunday. I never missed a service. 50 years, 60 years, sometimes even 70 years. Never missed a Sunday. The Lord will say to those who hear the word of God preached and are not affected by it at all, but leave every bit as dead spiritually, every bit as stone cold hearted as they were when they walked in, he'll say to them, I don't care. You heard what I said, and you said you want to keep your gods. Then keep them, but you have no part of this kingdom. That's a frightful thing. And it's oftentimes that we get to that juncture and we think of a God and that our culture loves to, to call and posit the God of love, which he absolutely is. First John. But we don't even begin to recognize the love of God until we first wrestled with his holiness. When we've wrestled with the fact that this God is just and righteous to condemn us all. For he is holy and we are not. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. If God is calling us to do something today, if the Lord has spoken which he has, 
what are we going to do? We have no other option than to follow after the Lord. But the author moves further, verses 26 and 27. At that time, during the time at Sinai, his voice shook the earth. Now, remember here, remember, they're at Sinai. The Lord speaks, they beg Moses, stop him, please. We cannot even hear his voice or his holiness will consume us. Understand, the same God that spoke then is the one that speaks now. The Lord who shook the earth by his voice spoke. But the author of Hebrews in verse 26 says, something greater has even come. He spoke then and gave them the law, but he's speaking now, and the revelation's even better. But now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, or also translated shakable. That, that is, things that have been made. So physical things themselves, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 26, that, that citation, as we looked at before, is from Haggai chapter 2. In the book of Haggai, is where the people they've been exiled, Israel and Jerusalem. They've been exiled into Babylon. They've spent 70 years there, and the Lord, by his grace and mercy, has brought them back into the land, a small remnant that was Israel. And they come back into the land, they come back into Jerusalem, and what do they see other than just complete decimation of the land? The temple, it's gone. The palace, it's gone. Everything there is gone. The ministry of Haggai was to encourage the people, to give them the word to say, it is the Lord's will that we establish right worship of the Lord again. And so he comes and he tells them, we must reestablish the temple worship of God. And so he comes to tell them, let's build this temple. But the author of Hebrews here takes that passage and cites it just a little bit differently to show them, here's the reality of the situation. The Lord shook the earth at Sinai, but he will shake the heavens and the earth now. Why? To undo the things that are physical and shakable. The people, the audience in the book of Hebrews are a group of Jewish Christians who want to go back. They say, yes, Jesus is Messiah. Yes, we confess that. All of this is good, but we want to hold to what we know. We want to hold the temple worship. We want to keep that. We like our sacrifices. We like the ritual cleansings. We, we, we like clean and unclean. It's clear to us. We know we just do this, 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 and this, and we're in. We're good. We can earn it. That was their misunderstanding. But the author of Hebrews says, no. No, dear brothers and sisters. The real temple, the one that is even greater than Solomon's, the one that's, that's overlaid with gold. You remember Solomon's temple. It's glory. It's majesty. You walk to the front of it, and the queen of Sheba herself is blown away. The temple that's better than that is the church. Do you want an even better temple? Not a place, but a people. The place where God and man dwell together. That's the temple that we long for, that scripture is longing for. And that's exactly what he's saying. Verse 27, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, he in interprets this for us, things that are made, things that are constructed, physical things, buildings, 
temples, whatever. Those things will be shaken. Why? So that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. That's precisely what we're seeing here. And that's the hope. Ephesians chapter 2. Starting with verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I must confess that I regularly worry I think we all do. It's probably fair. In light of the current political climate, in world politics even, in light of the future, in light of what I see oftentimes in universities today, and I think, what happens with the next generation? What happens to the church in 50 or 100 years in America. If I don't hold it together, it'll fall apart. Shame on me. Shame on me. And shame on all of us, because that's what we think, isn't it? Unless we do this, and this, and this, the church will fall apart. The people of God will be no more, and there will no longer be a witness in this world. Shame on us. We don't know how big God is. Oftentimes, I look at the politicians of today, and I think if they possibly are able to enact the legislation that they hope, the church will fall apart. We won't be able to build a building. We can't even pay the taxes for it. Shame on me. That's sinful. The church of God is something that they can't touch that the greatest powers that have ever existed throughout ever history and ever will exist, the church is something that's not built with hands. The church is something that they can't enter into and have power and dominion. It's something that when judgment day comes, they will bow their knee and confess Jesus is Lord. We stand in awe of the fact that by the very blood of Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we do not stand or wait in a place that can be taken away. We're not the building. We're the people. And there's great comfort there. But there's also other application here because so often, not only are we looking to the physical things of this world and the powers that be that we fear and we say, they can take away my right to worship the Lord. And that they can do. But they can't take away the church. But there's also things that we, that we do that we cling to, that keep us from rejoicing in the unshakable kingdom of God. The physical things of this world. I think to my little house. I love my little house. In a couple weeks, I'm going on a, a mission trip, taking about 40 11th graders with me. I'm going, I know, pray for me. <clears throat> I'll be sleeping on probably a very uncomfortable little cot that's framed out on some plywood. And those nights, I'll deeply miss my bed. I'll miss waking up and drinking my coffee and sitting in my reclining chair. I love my reclining chair. 
with my little light and my little heated blanket and having my Bible, and my coffee in my reclining chair and sitting quietly for a couple hours before I go to work. I miss that. In fact, I would go so far to say as I treasure that. And this is why it's so difficult for us sometimes to actually look to the real kingdom itself, to treasure the kingdom itself. Because we have so many treasure right here in our own lives, the physical things themselves. We have our cars, we have our phones, we have our houses, we have our garages, our swimming pools. We have so much treasure here. And we think, what would I ever do without this? This brings me so much joy. I can't let this go. I can't miss this or that. I can't, I can't, I can't give this up. This is what I long for. This is what I hope for. This is where I find joy and happiness. And that's why oftentimes our worship is so pitiful. Because we really enjoy not worshiping an eternal God, but we enjoy worshiping the things that bring us joy, the physical things. It's a painful thing for those shakeable things to be shaken away. But what a glorious gift of God that in the midst of the loss, that's why so often you see in the church global the happiest and the most worshipful Christians you'll ever meet are the ones who have nothing. And as painful as it is for them to miss a meal or five, makes the kingdom that much sweeter. It's a good thing when God reminds us, however difficult those situations may be, that take away those things that we rejoice in, to say, I'm giving you something even more to rejoice in myself. And so we have to ask ourselves, God has called us to worship and glorify him alone. Do we obey him? If God were to call us to give anything up, anything that's clinging to us and keeping us from running the race as we saw at the beginning of the chapter, anything that's stopping us from rejoicing in God alone, will you give it up? These can be good things. That's what God has called us to do, to fear him and him alone. It's very interesting in the book of Deuteronomy how under the explanation of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. One of the ways in which Moses explains, here's what that looks like, is to say, don't fear the nations around you. Don't fear the idols that they bring. But do what? Fear the Lord only. In a reverential, awe-stricken sort of way, fear God and fear him alone. But that takes us to our second question. Are you faithfully fearing the Lord? Here's what you must ask yourself. Am I grateful to God? Am I grateful to God? We see this in verses 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Hear what he's saying. Therefore, let us be grateful. Why? For receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The best words you can hear there 
is you've received something. That's a passive act. You, you didn't take it. That's active. You received it. It was given. But, but what, what's so good about it? Why should you be grateful for it? Because it's unshakable. But how is it unshakable? Because it's not made by you or I. It's not made by our doing. The unshakableness of the kingdom that we receive is based solely on the person of Christ. That's what's being called to us to do. To be grateful that we've received a kingdom that we don't deserve. That's not been built by us. That's not being kept by us. That we honestly have nothing to do with in and of ourselves, but that was done because of what Christ has done and because he's good and gracious and he's given it to us. But hear what he says about this kingdom. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Just a couple pages over, you get through James into 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, whom by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you hear that? Your inheritance, what you've received, is not because you're good. It's not because you're lovely. It's not because of really anything that you've done. But completely and totally grounded and rooted in what Christ has done on our behalf. This is what's known as the doctrine of adoption. We don't receive this heir, this sonship, this, this adoption, this bringing into the family of God because of things that we do. We receive it because the very Son of God has come and purchased for himself a people. We are therefore the children of God. That cannot be taken away because the eternal Son has identified us with himself. He's pulled us in and clothed us. He's taken away from us our names, our identities, as being our own and ourselves, and he has stamped on us in the sight of God, child. This is probably most wonderfully told in Romans chapter 8, if there is a Mount Everest in the Bible, it's the book of Romans. And if there's a Mount Everest in the book of Romans, it's chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Hear the correlation. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Are you faithfully fearing the Lord? If you're faithfully fearing the Lord, you recognize, I fear nothing else. I've received a kingdom and it is totally mine, and it cannot be taken away. Why? Because I didn't create it. I didn't sign the will to make me 
the heir of this kingdom. Christ did by his blood. And for all eternity, there's nothing that I do that that will make me worthy of this kingdom except for my identity in Christ as being adopted as the child of God. As long as Christ is the Son of God, which is eternally, so we receive the kingdom. Everybody loves a Cinderella story, don't we? Makes us feel happy that, you know, people come, the, you know, slum dog is brought up and now they're made royalty and they live happily ever after and, and we, you know, beautiful, little little tear when, when you see this. It's what everybody kind of wants, right? You, everybody wants to be swept off their feet by Prince Charming and receive a kingdom after kind of mopping floors with your toothbrush and that kind of stuff, being beat up by your stepmom. Now your stepmom has to pay you taxes. <laughs> what a great, what a great thought. But the Christian story, the life of the Christian, really is in so many ways the greatest Cinderella story of all. It's not that we were in the slums and Prince Charming came by and, you know, we had a wish granted and we went. It's, it's really actually better than that. It's more that we were in the slums and Prince Charming comes and picks us out and says, you're going to be heirs. You're going to receive a kingdom. You're going to be my wife. And we go, no thanks. It would be kind of an anticlimactic moment there and kind of a confusing story. But nonetheless, we would say, no thanks. I don't, I kind of like my little slum life here. I like living in the dumps, you know, and washing my clothes in dirty water and, you know, dysentery and all sorts of infections. This is much, much better. You keep your kingdom over there. And the, the king comes and says, no, I'm taking you regardless if you like it or not. And by the work that he does, in union with Christ, what do we receive? We receive the kingdom. That's the beauty of the church itself, the kingdom of God that we receive. We receive it because we are the bride of Christ. a little bit ashamed when I finally got married and my wife found out that uh, I in fact was not rich and we were not going to inherit a lot because that was probably the biggest motive. Well, he's not really all that good looking. He's a teacher. But, you know, at least he's rich. When, you know, he gets this inheritance, then he gets to keep it and then it's mine. Say all that silly, but the the principle stands that in the marriage union, you receive the inheritance of the spouse. That's what's happening here with the church. This glorious, unshakable kingdom that is ours because we are the bride of Christ. The question then becomes, are you grateful for it? Are you grateful for it? The author explains what this would look like. If you're truly grateful that you've received this kingdom, here's what happens. You offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. If you find your Christian life a season where things are cold, where you don't feel like God is speaking to you, where you don't feel your heart warmed, where you're not delighting in the Lord. It's not the Lord's fault. That's you. If you truly 
are grateful for receiving this kingdom that cannot be shaken, if you're truly grateful for receiving the gospel itself, that though we were sinners, Christ died for us. If you're truly grateful for that, there is no stopping the worship that follows. The reaction that comes with a true understanding, a true gospel-centered, Christ-exalting, God-glorifying life is a worship that is constant, a worship that is total, a worship that is unstoppable, a worship that is reverential. For our God is a consuming fire who's shown us his grace by sending his son to purchase us. If you get that, worship is not something you have to struggle to do. It's something that pours out of you. And the times in my life where I'm most joyful are the moments when I feel and understand the gospel the best. When I understand the weight of my own sinfulness and my own unworthiness to stand before God and my status in Christ. That is when Worship pours forth from Christians. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it really shouldn't be a struggle for us to gather together. Christians who have to have their arm twisted to come and gather with the bride of Christ, I ask them and say, do you even get the gospel? Do you even know God? But also, daily worship of the Lord. When it's a struggle for us to be excited to go into our workplaces and glorify God with our thoughts, words, and deeds, when that's a struggle, we've really got to check our hearts and say, am I even grateful? for the gospel. And if we aren't, we should venture to say that we're in fact not faithfully fearing the Lord. We don't know who he is, or we've forgotten, and we need to be reminded. So our plea this day is for us to search our hearts as a church and lay aside those things that have clinged to us, those things that need to be shaken from our core and live a life of reverential and awe-strickening worship of the great and holy God who is the creator and the sustainer of the world around us. I would venture to say that those who are looking for contentment this day those who are looking for satisfaction, those who are looking for joy, if you're looking for something other than God, then you're looking for the wrong things. Let us search our hearts and strive to faithfully fear the Lord. Let us go to him now in prayer. O oh Lord, You are the one whom the angels of heaven cry out unceasingly, holy, holy, holy. Lord, and we know that in this moment, our hearts, by union to Christ, stand now in the very throne room of God. May we never neglect this fact that we gather now in fellowship with the triune God, the eternal God, the holy God, by the blood of Christ. May we never take for granted the gospel itself, 
but way, may we always be reminded of who you are and who we are and what you've done for us. Lord, fix our hearts, I, on the cross that we might see the place where your holiness and your justice and also your love and mercy and grace meet. And may we rejoice, not in the fact or in the work of our own hands, but in the steady and sure foundation of Christ, our great high priest, the cornerstone of your church, the mighty fortress, which you are. Lord, we ask now that you would make our hearts sensitive, that you would open up our eyes to see the places where we have rested in the idols of our own hands, God. Help us to see these things that we might repent, O oh Lord, for we are a cold and dead social group if we are not a body of believers faithfully pursuing Christ. If we are not a praying church, if we are not a repentant church, if we are not a worshipful church, oh Lord, then we're no church at all. But Lord, make us one. Make us a church that pursue Christ, that loves you and seeks to glorify you in all that we do. Send us now into the world we would glorify you in the greatest way possible by fulfilling that which you've commissioned us to do. Make disciples. Be with us now. Keep us and guard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.